He's neither a madman nor a genius. And this is like, you know, one or the other of these things is consistently claimed in a lot of the like media narratives around him. And I think that that probably has multiple functions, but obviously one of them is to make him less relatable, right? To make it less like, you know, one, you know, one thing you could take away from this is that this is actually kind of a reasonable <laughs> response to the situation we're in. And, you know, that this is like a serious political position that one has to address on its own terms rather than, you know, purely in terms of psychopathology or somebody being so cognitively unique, you know, like somebody who lives in a world of mathematical abstraction or whatever that, you know, their priorities and values are just like utterly unlike our own, whatever, you know, so it's like, on the one hand, so much of what he says, just, it just feels like the 90s to me, it just feels like the radical environmental 90s. Hi, everyone. I guess I am continuing uh, the recent trend that I started with interviewing activists. If you guys saw artifact number 33 with Norman Finkelstein and several Palestinian refugees, I was speaking with people uh, with experience on the ground. And today I have with me Arnold Schroeder. He runs the Fight Like an Animal podcast. I discovered it uh, maybe about a year ago or so. My friend Keith Jakowicz, who uh, does uh, things with me on this channel as well, uh, he put me onto the podcast and I've been a, a, a patron uh, for the podcast also for about a year. Uh, Arnold Schroeder uh, covers climate activism. He covers climate research. Uh, he covers, uh, I guess we're going to be talking today, the left-right divide politically right what that means the kinds of changes that has gone uh, undergone historically one thing that i appreciate about uh, arnold's approach to all this is he sort of mirrors what uh, i've also been arguing before which is there isn't necessarily anything too scary about understanding human biology especially if you want to make a leftist sort of project right leftist i guess in the classical sense maybe the bernie sanders sense and Arnold covers that a lot in his podcast too, right? Specifically from his radical activist perspective. So um, today we're going to be discussing Ted Kaczynski's Unabomber Manifesto, right? Otherwise known as Industrial Society and its future. Uh, it, it has uh, a number of, of things that are relevant, not only to Arnold's podcast, but also some of the things that I discuss on this channel um, and maybe we could just sort of start with uh, a kind of like broad uh, overview uh, of the text, uh, some of the arguments. And I know that, uh, Arnold, you also read some other work by Kaczynski that I haven't read. So maybe you could sort of contextualize this book against some of the other stuff that he's uh, uh, written. And also, uh, I should have given you an opportunity to sort of say something else about yourself, if you so please. Uh, we, no, I mean, that's that's great. You did a great job. I'd say... The, the best way to understand my podcast is that I spent uh, 25 years like truly in the trenches and um, there's uh, ecological politics are subject to these acute temporal parameters. It's not like it's not like, you know, organizing against the criminal justice system, so-called or anything else where you can suffer defeats. Um, but there's never like a truly decisive defeat. You can always say that at some point in the future, you know, one's program is going to work out. And that's simply not true of ecological politics. And so I think that for a lot of us, there's this sense that uh, attempts to stave off uh, the destruction of the conditions that make our lives possible um, have really kind of like failed. And at a certain point, we have to like actually contend with that. And uh, so for me, uh, the podcast is um, an instance of of one stepping out of the activist trajectory and just really trying to examine the, the like like what we're doing and and why and uh, seeking out sort of like fundamental um, explanatory frameworks upon which our strategies are based. You know, like when we talk about political action, 
of necessity, it's going to be on like a more surface level, like, you know, uh, how many, you know, how wide is the road we're trying to blockade or, you know, like how many cops are already whatever, whatever the question is, you know, like, how likely are people to vote for a resolution? Um, but all of those conversations reflect deeper and often unarticulated sort of like social science, you know, like foundational theories about human nature and behavior and, you know, what's ultimately possible. And so, I, you know, I definitely was in that camp of, of rather than trying to articulate social theory and find a, uh, you know, like, like advocate for a sort of ultimate vision, um, to kind of like seek out points of convergence within people's existing worldviews that were the basis of like, you know, action. Um, and at some point, I really came to this conclusion that the ultimate stories we tell about the world and human humanity truly do matter. And like having the wrong story actually interferes with our ability to behave strategically. So that's, you know, that's what I've been doing for these last couple of years is making my way through a labyrinth of like evolutionary biology, psychology, um, history, social theory, and all the rest. And it's great fun. <laughs> it's, mm. it's, it's, I got to admit, I like it better than getting beat up by the police every goddamn day. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm doing. And uh, Ted Kaczynski, and his work is very much like uh, the political identity that was most central to me in my life was like the Earth First movement, which I consider to be more or less dead at this point. Um, and that's an interesting question in and of itself is like, why is there no radical environmental movement to speak of as our collective anxiety and grief about ecological collapse seems to grow? Um, but so, you know, to me, Kaczynski is somebody who can be situated pretty squarely within this like broader milieu that I come from. And it's really interesting to, to me to see how, as that movement has kind of faded from the public view, he's one of the only voices that remains um, in the public consciousness. Like the, you know, the newer generations mm -hmm. are like really more aware, I think, of the, the kind of like fundamental critique of industrial civilization via uncle ted than they are from any other source whereas at the time when he was doing when he was like still in his bombing campaign and when he released this text we we're going to talk about industrial society and its future it felt to me very much like standard fare you know it felt like one instance of many of this critique that a lot of us were advancing and uh you know because there was kind of like Earth First was to some extent sort of like a literary movement, you know, it was like about expressing this like sense of selfhood that encompassed all of all of the earth and being willing to fight for, you know, what we regarded as like, uh, you know, the the survival of ourselves, right? You know, like the um, the persistence of our extended selves. Um, it was kind of like this competition to see who could like articulate that most eloquently. And that wasn't really Ted Kaczynski, you know what I mean? And so for, for me at the time, his work didn't really register as like particularly significant, the actual text, like why he mattered was his tactics, his bombings. And now, you know, 20 years later, 25 years later, it becomes really clear that, uh, <laughs> you know, tying your message to political violence can actually matter because he's he's the one whose voice still resonates like pe people don't know who dave foreman is or whatever you know people know who ted kaczynski is yeah those are all interesting points um specifically also maybe with some of the provenance of uh ted kaczynski and uh, the effects that he had on younger activists or even if you're not an activist i mean i don't really consider myself a, an activist for instance but my uh, social circle uh, has often been filled with people uh, on on the left, let's say. And I remember in college uh, one time, uh, this woman that I knew, uh, she was telling me how when she was a teenager, uh, she was reading the uh, Unabomber Manifesto and just feeling kind of shocked that, okay, I know this guy's a terrorist. I know that I'm not supposed to like anything that he says or does. But I'm finding myself agreeing with it. And uh, a fascinating thing uh, that you can notice now is when you look at Ted Kaczynski videos on YouTube or you look at uh, maybe some articles written about him uh, that are open up to uh, public comments, people often say something like, 
you know, uh, you know, this guy was bad, or they didn't even lead with that. They're like, if you really just read the text itself, uh, he was based, right? He really, you know, was sort of like presaging the future. So there's this, a, a lot of like odd uh, love for him. But at the same time, I, I think to your point, Arnold, uh, when I was, uh, uh, I, I read uh, the text, the full text for the first time in the past week, I've read only bits and pieces of it before. And like you, my my response uh, before and also more recently uh, is along the lines of, this seems a little bit old hat, right? I, I know that there's like claims that he took most of his own claims and arguments from three or four different, I guess, philosophers at the time that he was influenced by. I don't know to what extent this is true versus to what extent maybe some things are original with him. But uh, I think approaching specifically from a writerly perspective, uh, what I do on my channel, it's, it's uh, at least half of it, let's say, is an arts-focused channel. When I uh, uh, when we discuss the arts and we think about great writers and great painters, um, I, I did this one artifact on uh, this book, Art and Physics, by this uh, writer, Leonard Schlein. And in it, he's making the argument that uh, when you see a truly great artist at work, what they often do is whether this is, he doesn't say this about writing, but you could extend it to writing. Uh, if they're truly great at their craft, they often presage many of the scientific developments, for example, let's say in painting, uh, whether it's like perspective or, or whatever, uh, in, in the art itself, right? And what I notice in writing is, you know, I'm just shocked when you sometimes look at some of the greatest poetry, greatest Roman poetry, uh, greatest uh, early English poetry. Um, so many of those ideas are just absolutely modern in a way that just everyday standard fair prose from that time period would simply not capture the kind of psychological complexity that you might be able to get from a truly standout John Donne poem, right? John Donne could presage everything from feminism right to the end of like Christian conceptions of love in a way that prose at the time simply couldn't conceptualize. So with Ted Kaczynski, one thing I notice is, um, you know, he writes in a very kind of uh, standard way, right? There isn't necessarily all that much charisma with the writing. Uh, the craft itself is sort of, you know, I don't like, I don't remember, for instance, like even a single, you know, like, wow, that was a really interesting sentence, you know, um, uh, after reading it you know, just very recently. There are some specific things I want to focus on as ideas, but in terms of the craft, right, it, it does really seem like, uh, unlike, you know, instead of being a visionary, he's more so someone that uh, is almost inevitably coming to exist based on pre-existing social pathologies, whether it's like where we're going with climate, right? Where we're going politically, the kinds of pathologies that are present in uh, leftists, right? That he's critiquing in the text, right? Uh, he himself is not so much the person to give, you know, the final sort of comment, but he's someone that could, you know, typify also himself some of these pathologies. Yeah, and I, I do think that, you know, there's I think there's two really interesting separable components of Kaczynski that have to be understood to understand kind of him and his work. And one is that sense in which, um, you know, I've, I've talked about him on other podcasts where I was like, he's neither a madman nor a genius. And this is like, you know, one or the other of these things is consistently claimed in a lot of the like, media narratives around him and i think that that probably has multiple functions but obviously one of them is to make him less relatable right to make it less like you know one you know one thing you could take away from this is that this is actually kind of a reasonable <laughs> response to the situation we're in and you know that this is like a serious political position that one has to address on its own terms rather than you know purely in terms of psychopathology or somebody being so cognitively unique, you know, like somebody who lives in a world of mathematical abstraction or whatever that, you know, their priorities and values are just like utterly unlike our own, whatever, you know, so it's like, on the one hand, so much of what he says, just, it just feels like the 90s to me, it just feels like the radical environmental 90s. Um, but then, um, I don't, are you familiar, do you know, like the psychological experiments he was subject to in his college days and all that? Are you yeah, I, I, I don't know all the details, but I had read about them. Yeah. Experiments that basically would not be allowed, uh, in the modern day. Totally. Yeah. I mean, just like, like very, very like overtly 
you know, acknowledged like what we're trying to do with these experiments is see, you know, the extent to which we can like kind of like psychologically defeat somebody <laughs> by mm -hmm. by insulting them. And, you know, and um, I, I would say that in his work, in his case, it didn't really work. And the bombings were the result. Right. You know, and that there you, you have to understand. And to me, this, so this is I'm, I'm fascinated by Kaczynski in this way because some of our biographies overlap and there are like people have compared him to me over and over again throughout my life you know ha 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 but um you know i grew up being tortured in a religious cult and that experience absolutely i'm absolutely clear it completely like shaped my not just my perspective right because again kaczynski shares a perspective with a lot of people but the sort of like program of action that i was willing to to take based on that perspective and that's what distinguishes kaczynski and so, you know, there, I think that there's this sense in which if you get pushed that far, if you're subject to um, attempts at social control that are that extreme, there is a little bit of a binary where you're either going to break or you're going to turn into somebody who like lives a life of pretty like dedicated opposition to those kinds of systems. And, you know, and so I, I think that there's this sense in which, sure, the man, you know, like through his own innate sort of characteristics like his heritable psychological tendencies but certainly also through the experiences the formative experiences he had with like efforts at psychological manipulation i think that there's a case to be made that um those experiences kind of forced him to actually come to terms with the nature of the society we inhabit in a way that others are kind of like more able to distance themselves from right and that a lot of the sort of like the industrial society in its future is way less as much as I associate it with radical environmentalism. It's way less concerned with uh, the effects that industrial civilization is having on the global ecosystem and way more concerned with the loss of autonomy that is um, like, you know, sort of implicit in the industrial system. And like, you know, he, he goes goes into this argument from many perspectives many different times about how like the sheer scale of the forces that we've created uh via technology and mass society uh render anybody's individual life and the actions they can take kind of inconsequential how you know he uses that what's the what's the term he uses the power the power process the power process right yeah. you know talks about how that's like this fundamental human need exists to like basically have agency and that we live, we've created systems in, in which essentially nobody really does, not even to some meaningful extent, people in ostensible positions of power. Mm -hmm. l l let's actually take uh, the opening paragraph. I have it right here yeah. of um, uh, his, his tract. And uh, I guess just kind of like a, uh, uh, assess our responses to it because i think that's going to set the tone for maybe the rest of the discussion so it begins like this the industrial revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race they have greatly increased the life expectancy of those of us who live in advanced countries where they have destabilized society have made life unfulfilling have subjected human beings to indignities have led to widespread psychological suffering in the third world to physical suffering as well and have inflicted severe damage on the natural world. The continued development of technology will worsen the situation. It will certainly subject human beings to greater indignities and inflict greater damage on the natural world. It will probably lead to greater social disruption and psychological suffering, and it may lead to increased physical suffering even in advanced countries. So uh, the first thing that I would say is... Um, I mean, uh, many of these points uh, on the face of it, uh, I guess they're uh, reasonable. Um, one thing that I appreciate here in particular is the fact that uh, if you read someone like uh, Steven Pinker, uh, for those watching, I actually did a show on Steven Pinker's book, In Lime Now. It's almost like six hours long or something. Uh, it was one of the earlier artifacts from, uh, I believe it was like May or June of 2021. Um, and as I was going through this book, uh, one thing I noticed is that Steven Pinker is extremely shy 
about sort of really laying it all out there, right? So it's perfectly, I think, within his right to make claims about uh, human progress, right? I lean more towards Pinker's direction, maybe with some of the climate stuff accepted, that uh, uh, there is discernible human progress. I think, for instance, if you want to get human beings on some sort of leftist project, you can't simply tell them, and by the way, guys, everything that we've ever tried failed and things are just getting worse and worse, right? That's not going to get them interested in anything that you have to say, because if anything, that's just like a way for them to really double down and live very selfish lives. But uh, Steven Pinker, even if he has the right to make that argument, uh, he's very shy about really weighing what it all means, right? In terms of just like gross tonnage, let's say, of bodies, right? Um, the fact that uh, he's able to sit around and write on his computer, right, uh, created by slave labor, right, um, uh, it, 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 it means that he has to consistently put something out into the world that is at least of equal value to the corpses that he's standing upon, right? And um, people might not like those kinds of calculations, but all of history is really those calculations exactly, right? Uh, if, uh, uh, you know, the, the if the proportion of the super pores is, is less now than it was historically, well, can't we say something about the fact that with increasing population, you know, we simply have now billions and billions upon people? That is a, a number that never existed before that are in extreme poverty, right? There's a kind of like Nietzschean sort of set of calculations that he's very shy about. And by the way, he also has a, a one of the worst chapters in the book is a chapter where he tackles Nietzsche. Um, and uh, he, you know, I, I think it's kind of obvious why he's so, you know, kind of like emotionally... Uh, wounded by the existence of this philosopher because, uh, you know, say what you will about uh, Nietzsche's uh, personality or maybe some of his, uh, you know, other kind of political calculations. But I think specifically viewing things, you know, in this way, like what corpses are we really standing upon and what are we doing out of it, right? Do we have actually, you know, do we have choices in life? Do we have options in life if in fact someone can tell us in actuality, yes, you are standing on a corpse. Now you have to live your life accordingly. What will you do with the fact that your existence here in America is really at the expense of so many people, right? That you'll never see or hear from, right? They will just silently feed you. They will silently provide you your gadgets. And are you simply going to live a life where you're just like fucking around on some devices playing games? Or are you going to do something more worthwhile? Are you going to bring a tent? You know, so anyway... Um, the fact that he, uh, from the very beginning, uh, Kaczynski makes that distinction, I think it's very important. Um, one thing I would disagree with, though, is when he starts talking about uh, instability in society, uh, uh, you know, I, I granted, like, I, I think there's plenty of instability in society now, specifically due to climate, technology, all those things. Uh, the fact that, um, you know, you, you can't really live on a single income anymore, like all those things are true. At the same time, I really do wonder, and this kind of touches on a lot of other claims that he makes later, uh, when we say instability, what are we comparing this to exactly? Because I can imagine 200 years ago, life in some ways being a lot more stable in many other ways, being very unstable, especially if you look a certain way, right? If you live in a certain place, uh, much more so though now. So uh, like, I guess, like, what, what are your responses to that initial paragraph and maybe some of the things that I just mentioned? Yeah, well, I, so I think, I, like, relating it to Steven Pinker is actually super interesting. I, I think it, it was just yesterday I was writing this thing with uh, Pinker in mind, which is that when we talk about um, contemporary conditions and engage in any variety of this, like, let's contrast it with the hypothetical past, you know, like, whatever the terminology we use, like, traditional societies or, like, hunter-gatherer societies or, you know, whatever our frame is, um, I you like the thing that I was pointing out is that um, a bunch of terms and like concepts become very like strangely conflated in a way that reflects kind of like a you know just like a sort of morality tale um, more than anything like you know a, a logical interrelationship where like what we're doing is kind of like um, conflating variables based on whether we generally associate them with prosociality and benevolence as opposed to like, you know, the the counterparts thereof. And so like, uh, 
one example that I think does come up in, I haven't read Enlightenment now or The Better Angels of Our Nature, but it comes up in these like Pinker versus like Rousseau-esque discussions is like we will tend to conflate hierarchy and violence when obviously these two things are not the same thing, right? You know, where it's like, um, you know, like a, a discussion about whether traditional societies were hierarchical will very rapidly um, transition into a, a discussion of the murder rates, you know, like is Yanomamo society, you know, is it hierarchical? Suddenly a discussion about how, like what the homicide rate is. Those are two different questions, you know, like we can have like a wild west uh, sort of society, right? Where power relations are essentially equalized, where violence can plausibly initi be initiated by any given party against any other party. And there's not such a radical asymmetry of power that that's implausible. You know, so it's like we can live in an egalitarian, <laughs> hyper-violent society. And that happens. You know, it's it's very common, like the colonization of Iceland by Nor uh, Norwegians was kind of like that. You know, like there's often a Wild West phase when um, people are expanding into some kind of like frontier, um, you know, where... There's not there's not sufficient concentrations of power to diminish violence, uh, the capacity for violence into like one concentrated source, you know, and so it's like people kill each other, but it's also an egalitarian society. And likewise, cooperation versus competition is often conflated with, uh, once again, hierarchy versus egalitarianism, whereas, of course, like, uh, you know, when the Nazis are invading Poland, this is a hyper hierarchical society imposing further hierarchies but it's also like an act of mass cooperation and coordination and you know a thing we know about egalitarian societies uh whether they like are hunter gatherers or whether they practice agriculture is that often one of the mechanisms they use for maintaining egalitarianism is um like dispersion right you know it's like the, like an escape potential and an ability to disaggregate into smaller social units right you know so and i think that that gets into this interesting, like, I would say Ted K is really, really focused on, like, how, uh, his conception of freedom. And to some extent, he prioritizes that at the expense of, you know, like other values we might consider benevolent and pro-social, like, uh, you know, comfort or like uh, even like interpersonal connection or social cohesion. And certainly, you know, obviously, like our ability to sort of like manifest new human potentials through like mass coordination and cooperation right you know it's like it seems like a personal autonomy and again this really to some extent probably hugely reflects the developmental experiences he had but that, that seems like utterly paramount and other values are just like are less so and so there's it's interesting there's um there's a few like political sort of factions that have really been influenced by him you know the like probably the most extreme cases in latin america the like what is it the its the individuals tending towards wildness or whatever i don't know if you're familiar no, but... i never heard of this no so it's like they started as like a kind of classic like anarcho primitivist faction and then they just got into this like phase of like straight like fatalism where they were like we're you know we believe that the human project is totally doomed and that ecological collapse is inevitable but we're going to run around bombing things and, and like literally killing people to like assert this kind of like you know this like spirit of human freedom that exists in spite of all this or whatever right and um there's a book written by kaczynski's translator um into spanish uh called uh repent to the primitive that is kind of similar where he's like he's basically saying i'm a primitivist but for me that doesn't mean that i think that uh hunter-gatherer societies uh lived in perfect harmony with nature or with each other right he's like i think that hunter-gatherers caused mass extinctions of megafauna at the end of the mm -hmm. pleistocene and i of think course, yeah. considerable like interpersonal violence right and you know so that's like that's kind of the frame to me that's the, that's the attitude or the way to understand it is this like it's this anti-tech fundamentalism that is really really prioritizing freedom at the expense of like really any other value that one could could posit you know and and that is how it has to be understood and if you accept that frame i don't think he's wrong you know like if 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 like autonomy of that variety is really what's absolutely the most important to you then i think 
you kind of, you know, then like an argument against technological mass society naturally does proceed from that. But of course, even with freedom, it really depends on the frame you select, right? You know, like one's freedom to like escape surveillance or like mass social control, uh, you know, like maybe that conflicts with, uh, you know, <laughs> your freedom to drive down the interstate or whatever, like your freedom to like pursue scientific inquiry. Like I understand that, you know, my life is very wrapped up in scientific inquiry. And to some extent that implies like the use of tools and techniques and technologies that I feel very ambiguous about, you know, it, like, like some of what I know about biology comes from cutting open animals in labs. Right. And it, it right. Right. And these are, these are, tra these are like trade-offs. Right. And so like, I think Kaczynski is very much focused on the autonomy dimension of like the conceivable range of values one would be willing to fight for. Yeah. Um, so, so specifically, uh, I, I was going to get into this a little bit later, but since we're on the topic, uh, you know, it, it's not even so much uh, to me, at least that Kaczynski is privileging freedom over other kinds of values. It, it's also kind of alluding to what you said about proper framing. Uh, it's just his conception of freedom, is simply not my conception of freedom. Yeah. Right. Uh, and this kind of speaks to uh, the whole kind of like, you know, inversions that we get with right, left, right, left, and the kinds of values that they seem to, you know, uh, change like gloves all the time uh, without uh, seemingly without issue. Uh, when he starts discussing, for instance, um, you know, the, so to him, this idea of the power process uh, uh, as it relates to his work is uh human beings that they they used to be able to have dignity right they used to be able to engage in activities that were not uh simply what he calls surrogate activities which are activities that you might undertake to alleviate boredom and activities that you do uh in lieu of actually trying to sort of uh provide for yourself for like actual physical sustenance right uh centuries ago obviously uh, most uh, human action uh would be geared towards sustenance now tons of human action tends to be diverted into all kinds of directions but um there is something to what he says uh, when it comes to uh this idea of uh, you might have less dignity now but at the same time uh his his conception of this kind of like either a wild west type or like a, a homesteader uh, you know early american colonist or whatever going out west when i think of a world like that um it doesn't strike me as very free in many many important you know uh, dimensions first of all uh i when we were exchanging notes uh i i mentioned how during the time of the wild west in american history we had a murder rate of anywhere between 250 to 500 per 100,000 people. To put that into perspective, if you take the, the poorest black neighborhood now in America, the top 100 poorest, most violent black neighborhoods, um, they're classically associating conservative minds with murder and all this mayhem and all this other stuff. Though Those numbers of murder would not approach the numbers in the Wild West. Right. So in a very important respect, if you're not able to, you know, uh, do what you want to do in terms of sustenance without literally having to go to war against mar marauding little cartels, that doesn't seem like a very free society to me. Granted, if you happen to be one of the victors among these cartels, certainly that might provide you a lot of feelings of, you know, uh, dignity or, or however you want to define it. But generally speaking, you know, uh, it's simply not true. The, the second part is uh, when he starts uh, discussing uh, the whole kind of like, um, you know, social climbing aspect to American society and, and world society at large, uh, there's a lot to that critique. Um, and uh, what I would say is, uh, you know, the kind of society that he kind of like romanticizes in the past, it wouldn't allow really people like a Ted Kaczynski to thrive, right? Like it seems on the one hand that he's really into having society where people with all kinds of talents and abilities could fill, fill certain kinds of niches. Um, at the same time, like, uh, you know, Ted Kaczynski likely wouldn't thrive. 
I probably wouldn't thrive all that much in some of these societies. I am, after all, a 5'8 male who weighs 145 pounds. Uh, and uh, I've never, you know, uh, uh, thought negatively of that at all. But if I were living 200 years ago and I had to survive in uh, Russia at the time, maybe the fact that I was 5'8 and 145 pounds would be a, a real problem for me. So um, I, 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 you know, I understand uh, some of his uh, desires and some of the kind of kinds of size that he wants to establish. But I think many of the specifics that he begins to lay out, that's when uh, problems start to arise, right? When you get away from the kind of conceptual muddle of maybe what these societies are to really when he starts drawing in examples, you know, like, like, like I said, like uh, freedom is nice and all, but specifically, how are you defining it? Um, so that's what I well, would say. Yeah. And that's like... Um... I, my claim about like, you know, I think it's really interesting, like say, take the left, right divide, for instance, I would say that at its core, both left and right political perspectives present these values of, um, you know, advocacy of freedom and against alienation. And then it's just literally like, but how you conceive of that is the difference, right? You know, and so it's like, um, at one extreme, we could say like, but but these really are the kind of, I mean, it's not that extreme. These are like actually the kind of distinctions we're making is like, you know, one person's freedom to poison the water diminishes somebody else's freedom to drink the fucking water, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and like both of those actually like you can like establish frames wherein either one of those, you know, is is like considered like the greater freedom or the more fundamental sort of like value that has to be fought for um and then likewise with alienation it's like to me it seems like it comes down to like uh right wingers conservatives whatever uh tend to see alienation increasing with the deterioration of traditional social structures with like the decline of like families or whatever right um you know and a leftist morality tends to see alienation stemming from cruelty towards one another, you know, like a willingness to exploit one another. But yeah, that like, I, I think that you can seriously look at almost all like political conflicts and uh, differences of opinion about social organization and see how uh, on some kind of ultimate level, exactly like you said, man, it's like, it just depends on how you define freedom, because what they're all ultimately saying is that they are like attempts to maximize freedom. But there's no way that, like freedom in the abstract always it's always going to imply limitations somewhere else. Like any given freedom implies constraints being imposed somewhere else. You know, like my like my freedom to not be in a cage only exists at the expense of somebody else's freedom mm -hmm. to put me in a cage. Or we could, you know, if we want to sound a little more sympathetic, somebody else's freedom to not feel afraid of like the, the kind of person I am walking around on the same streets as them, right? Yeah. You know, and so that's like, you know, and, and so, yeah, so like what is like the kind of freedom that that Uncle Ted is all about? I, I think it is kind of funny. He shares this tendency with a lot of like a lot of those like kind of like basement nazis who are all like you know like i want to live in a society of like of like unmitigated cruelty where like the strong rise i'm like are you sure about that on like a personal level <laughs> like, like you want that because you'll do well in that and i and i know people i know like occult right wingers who are like i acknowledge that I will not survive the kind of society that I want to create. So, you know, like, at least to me, that's a logical, con logically consistent, like commitment to a certain kind of freedom. Um, but yeah, you know, and I would also say of his whole trip that it suffers from the same kind of ambiguity that all, all politics based on recapitulating the mythic past do, where it's like kind of fuzzy, you know, like when exactly was this that like we were all free and wild and things were, you know, and it's like so often whether we're talking about like uh, like milk toast kind of conventional American conservatism that's sort of glorifying what exactly like America six or seven decades ago or something, you know, or whether we're talking to like anarcho primitivists or like, you know, capital T traditionalists, it's like, you know, well, it's sort of like you want to recapitulate the Roman Empire, but it's sort of like you want to recapitulate the Middle Ages. You know, it's just like it's very fuzzy. And if you try to like actually like name a specific time and place where human society actually sort of like manifested these values that are being espoused, 
you, you kind of can't, you know, and, and yeah, so I mean, he definitely has that. But again, he has that in common with uh, with like radical environment, the radical environmental mm -hmm. milieu from the time he was from the time he wrote Industrial Society and its future, you know, it was like this sort of like promotion of a very ambiguous primitive past, you know. This fuzziness reminds me of, um, you know, it's something that extends even to people that are, let's say, well integrated into at least some kind of society, right? Uh, I was doing a bunch of uh, Russia related stuff in this channel, and I was reading Alexander Dugan's The Fourth Political Theory. Um, and originally, I was thinking maybe I should do a video on this. But honestly, after reading through it, it seems to be you know, it seems to be like a total uh, paper tiger, like essentially it's this, you know, it's it's uh, uh, at least it forms part of the basis of like modern Russian geopolitics alongside his 97 book, Foundations of Geopolitics. And um, any, it seems like anybody that is advocating, so in his idea of the fourth political theory is something that we need to get beyond liberalism, we need to get beyond Marxism, and we need to get be, uh, beyond fascism. But this this uh, fourth uh, idea that he's uh, trying to sketch out, uh, it, it simply seems like it's a recap of all these other things in different variations, right? Like when he was uh, uh, arguing in 2014 about the invasion of uh, uh, Crimea uh, with some French philosopher, he was like, and we didn't go far enough. We should have not just invaded uh, Crimea. We should have invaded all of Ukraine and enacted a spiritual renewal. And when, I'm, when I thought, when I when I was uh, thinking about that, I was like, well, how is that really different from any kind of like liberal hegemonic project of the past thirty years, where we're like, okay, you know, we're not going to say spiritual renewal, but we're going to invade Afghanistan and Iraq to uh, make them undergo a democratic renewal, right? It's just a different word. Right. It's very it seems like it's very difficult to escape the logic of liberalism. But even if you try, you seem to kind of like just be, you know, uh, anytime that you try to create something new, you seem to be uh, retre retreading the same kind of material, the same stuff that has already been a, a long uh, old hat. Um, and this doesn't seem, you know, very different because like just like with Dugan, when Kaczynski gets very specific in what he wants to see happen, right? It's like you said, well, I've seen this many times already before, right? And I know how some of this ends or or tends to end. So uh, there, there's, there, there seems to be something and it, it does speak to, you know, the modern dissatisfaction with what is available to us in terms of theorizing. Like, you know, I used to be a Marxist. I guess that's the thing that I'm still closest to. I definitely did not become like a reactionary with age. But from my teenage years into like I've always had like skepticism, right? Like one of the things was, well, you know, I have skepticism when it comes to some of the science that they push, like sociologically, the whole like denial of human nature angle. You know, a lot of the stuff just didn't sit well with me. So like there's always this craving, right, for something new and different. And yet, you know, in the end, um, you're not really making anything that's truly, you know, truly different. I think ultimately the kind of society that I see long term is probably something uh, fairly close to some level of, you know, egalitarian distribution. But, I, you know, I don't think that true democracy in the way that, you know, we, we think of it is probably uh, sustainable. There's probably going to be a mix of like democracy with like, it's like a hybrid system with maybe, you know, people that are capable of, of making actual decisions. Of course, like that also opens you up to like, there's people like Christopher Langan that I did a video on, this ostensibly super high IQ guy with every single idea that he puts forward just tends to be total dog shit, you know, that doesn't understand anything about anything. And yet, you know, um, it's nothing that we could talk about uh, IQ as it relates uh, to all this. But anyway. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that a thing, a theme that I am constantly promoting is this notion of, you know, like, uh, complexity emerging from synthesis from like a narrow passage between ostensibly like opposed kind of like uh realms of analysis or like you know states of being or whatever and i you know uh, on my better days i can make mathematical arguments for it but um like one one simple way that i that i use to uh to kind of illustrate how i think this has like concrete uh you know tangible political value is in looking at the revolutionary movements in recent years that have like in the last few decades that have been just like personally inspiring to me, uh, like two that really leap to mind right away are the Zapatistas and mm -hmm. the uh, the Rojavan, you know, uh, the Kurdish autonomists. And in both cases, it's like this really 
really dynamic synthesis of a traditional framework with like a you know a um a you know new politics with a with like a you know they, they're simultaneously striving into like new terrain with like a lot of awareness of uh, identity uh, you know that that comes from like a long uh, lineage of the past and like i i am totally sympathetic like for for whatever critique i just offered of like you know the fuzziness of um the any any politics of like recapitulating the mythical past you know like how it, it always has like these same kind of these same kind of like deficiencies of specificity um I, I think there's something there, you know, and I, I totally like a, a book that I absolutely love um, that I thought was a great, like a great kind of window into like some of the artistic and political movements that have occupied my life more than a century later was um, this book, uh, The Rights of Spring, The Great War and the Birth of the Modern Age by Madras Eckstein. Um, so he uses the reaction to World War One and the kind of like artistic freak out. He uses the the Stravinsky piece Rite of Spring as like a, a frame for talking about that broader reality that like after World War One, people were so, you know, so psychologically affected by the meaningless horror of mechanized warfare that they'd just been exposed to that you know kind of every like the progress narratives were sort of off the table all of a sudden and a, a radical you know a radical questioning of anything we might have taken for granted previously was like very on the table and that a thing that we saw was movements emerge uh like futurism which eventually merged into fascism but also you know like dadaism um and surrealism which had more affinities with like anarchism and such you know um where uh there was this kind of like very complex sort of never resolving tension between traditional elements and like hyper experimental you know like novelty seeking elements right you know like in the rite of spring is a good example of that where on the one hand like the themes are pagan russia and human sacrifice like fertility spirits and all that but then the music and the, you know like the actual approach it's not like this is an actual russian tradition they're recapitulating and you know their approach to it was like wildly experimental and um I, you know i do i just really do think there's something there's something there there's something I, I always say that synthesis isn't balance and that um the whole like tradition versus like you know blindly like throwing ourselves headlong into a uh, novel socio-political terrain and technological terrain like i think that there's a way that we can it's not balance it's not just seeking like the median point of those things but like i think there's a way we can hypothetically integrate those tendencies into something that's different than either of them in isolation in their extremes you know and like the i don't have a great like okay so like to use technology as an example like a way that synthesis wouldn't be balanced you know obviously like if we took two poles like primitivism and transhumanism the the like if we just sought the median point it'd be like okay let's embrace the technology of say like you know the enlightenment or something i don't know um but then synthesis like a true an integrated understanding of those poles might be something like let's go like let's stop living in a resource extraction based economy like let's localize our economies but let's use whatever material like extractive material means and methods we need to to keep our communications infrastructure and our capacity to like make art and do scientific inquiry intact right like let's go live in little huts that have the internet or whatever and i'm not saying that that's specifically like the actual right paradigm but it's just an example of how you can like take those those extremes and like integrate them into something that's qualitatively different than either of them are in isolation and I, I I think that's kind of the like right way to you know to, mm -hmm. for lack of a more sophisticated phrasing to approach uh politics but but that's always hard it's uh you know anywhere you go in any like social political discourse anywhere in the landscape you'll find people orienting towards like a more extreme and unintegrated version of a truth than is like probably healthy or useful you know yeah I, I mean i think in general that that applies to uh politics uh this kind of like uh synthesis of elements is also uh just to get a sense of how um you know how kind of like universal it is like even in the arts right i mean ultimately you know one thing that i often say is uh 
uh, I, I mean, you can't be like a great writer if you don't read, right? That's, uh, yeah. you, you have this like weird uh, Twitter discourse every once in a while, you know, by people that call themselves writers. And I guess they they mean in the kind of like strictly professional sense, right? They get paid to release words, but they say things like, you know, isn't it ableist to say that to be a writer, you need to be a reader, you know, it's, just, you know, it's, it's very, you know, it's, it's very silly, so aggressive. True. You know, it's like it's a tapping, you know, lefty language for something totally, just uh, t totally asinine. But I mean, in, in the arts, right, that's exactly how it is, right? Uh, nothing is truly, truly new, right? It's always going to be a recombination of, of the past in some way. Even someone that comes in a scene in a way that totally shocks the world, like Walt Whitman and his style of lines, right, his style of free verse, that shocked the world, but at the same time, you know, if you're searching for analogs, guess what? 2,000 years ago, you have so many, you know, uh, um, like these like long biblical lines, right? And and then you have, you know, later on, you have the King James Version, right? And, and, and suddenly you start seeing these analogs. I mean, there's so many similarities between the King's, uh, the King James Version of the Bible and Walt Whitman, right? That um, you know that it must have been uh, an influence, right? And uh, politics uh, being something that is even more kind of like, I guess, uh, uh, physically resultant, so it's, it's a little less abstract, right? Um, it, it's going to play out in, in that way as well. Um, uh, I, I'm wondering, what, what, what do you think about? So, like, I, I think one of the best uh, claims, right? The most one of the most powerful claims in, in the text is when Kaczynski is, is starts with this idea that technology uh, when it begins right it starts with always being optional right no matter you know whatever the thing being invented right um always you know they're speaking to the whole kind of like left right psychological divide there's always going to be a large percentage of people that are uh, very nervous with the advent of anything, right? Anything new comes in scene, they're going to be nervous. That speaks to, I guess, long-term sort of biological imperatives to not do anything too much, too crazy, too impulsive, or else you will risk your own survival if you go too fast, too soon. Um, but uh, the pushback against uh, the kind of like uh, uh, Luddites w would always be something like, well, technology is optional, right? And very soon it, it no longer becomes optional, right? Um, cars maybe at some point were optional for uh, all of America. Now in much of America, uh, they're not optional, right? I remember like when I was living in New Jersey and uh, my parents were still living in in New York City, and I had no car uh, in the suburbs. I remember, like, to go see friends, I would walk ninety minutes, two hours, come home with bloody socks, right? And that was like a, a typical sort of experience, right? Um, you needed to get a car to get around. Same thing with cell phones. Cell phones. I remember, like, I resisted getting a smartphone for many years. It was only you know, like uh, well after uh, they became mainstream that I finally got a, got a smartphone. And suddenly all these things that seem to be optional, such as I, I, I want to just check what's going on on Twitter, right? You know, you don't need to do that. Most of the time you don't. Maybe, maybe, maybe if it's useful to you, maybe you could do it once a week, right? You could spend literally 20 minutes and you will get literally all that you need. But now you have this impulse in many places now, right? They are uh, the kind of like the thing that you have instead of computers, right? Um, for example, many black Americans, while they don't have uh, computers in their homes, they have smartphones, right? Which uh, it provides that same service, which means that it's necessary now for a job, right? Um, so putting all these things together, like the, the window of, you know, like human activity, it does get both expanded by technology, but also in ways that are very kind of insidious and hard to notice as they're happening. They, they become circumscri circumscribed by the advent of technology. And, and he sort of characterizes as this bargain, like if you come up to, you know, if a more powerful farmer comes up to you and says, I want 50% of your, of your land, this is, you know, Israel, Palestine, I want half of your land. And you can't resist, so you say, fine, take half. And then he comes back. And of course, it's more and more and more, right? And eventually, uh, you're left with nothing. And um, we, we're sort of, I guess, seeing this more now with like smartphone technology. But I think that that's one of the features of the text. That is one of the things, plus his comments also on boredom, right? This inability to be bored. You know, when you read it in the 90s, it, it, it must have, a, it hits you kind of differently than it hits people now, right? Because now people are totally 
unable to be bored, right? I mean, even, you know, even preparation for this conversation, I just had a walk today. I was listening to some episodes of your podcast, you know, instead of like being in my own head, you know, suddenly I have, I have some little, you know, noise, right? Some little, you know, verbiage right in my head. So anyway. Yeah. I mean, and no, it is, it's a, that's actually this really intense thing is if like you were around at the time Kaczynski was writing and you can remember dialogues like his and how much like, you know, like one of the, one of those classics of, uh, of like nineties social theorizing and various like sub echelons of the political landscape was like, we would have these discussions about the mediation of experience. You know, that was like a, a very recurrent theme, like, Oh, like us technology intensifies, you know, we're having like less and less direct experiences and everything is becoming hyper mediated. And like, now that conversation is just kind of over because it's like, like the level of hyper mediation has crossed some kind of threshold where it just doesn't even feel like we need to talk about it anymore. Right. It's like mm -hmm. the mediation one, you know, and yeah, absolutely. The, I mean, there's, there's this great, uh, interdisciplinary, I don't know if they still publish, but there was this interdisciplinary journal called the Anthropocene Review or Anthropocene Review that uh, I put out at least like a couple issues. And in their inaugural issue, that was that was like one of the themes. And it was like a real trip to see scientists just have like this candid, serious discussion about like that question, like is technology something that should be thought of as um, subject, you know, an expression of human agency and like something that exists to further any like identifiable human end or not, you know, and, and it's like, a, it's just a totally valid question in my, in my own experience in life. Um, you know, because when I was like 16 years old, I had this big, like the civilization I inhabit is destroying everything kind of like, you know, like I really, really like I walked away hard, you know, I spent like a couple couple of years of my adolescence I mean literally like almost unwilling to enter buildings and stuff you know and just like really trying to like figure out some way to live on my own terms like land squatting and you know like dispersed you know like agriculture and like a lot of dumpster diving and stuff like that you know but like um I didn't I learned to drive when I was 35 for instance and the reason that I learned to drive was literally oh, I, I still don't know how to drive and I'm 35 Good for you, man. Good for you. Don't oh, start. Man. Just check it out. I learned how to drive. Like I didn't need it. Like I got by just fine without driving. And I literally learned to start in order to blockade oil trains. Like I was uh -huh. doing all these blockades and I was like, okay, if I have my own car, this is going to go really differently than if I always have to like, you know, employ mm -hmm. somebody else's services. So I like, I like, you know, saved a quarter's worth of student loans and I went out and got myself like an SUV and I blockaded a bunch of oil trains with it. And now like, I cannot conceive of life without it. Now I'm 44 and I just like, can't function without a car. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, like, and, and so much stuff like that. Like I organized tons of protests and stuff before there was social media or smartphones or anything. And I literally can't remember how we did it. I'm not exaggerating. Like, I don't remember what we did before mm -hmm. we had these tools in our hands. Yeah. And so it's like, I think that's, I, I think that that point that he makes is just like, without qualification, just absolutely true. You know, technologies start out as these optional things that ostensibly expand freedom and, and very quickly in this, in this way that really does like, yeah, like inevitably is just going to cause some like systems theory level, like question about like what technology fucking is, you know, is it just like the next stage of evolution? Is it is it domesticating us or did we domesticate it? You know, is it using us? Are we using it? You know, I, I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't we get into uh, the whole uh, right left divide and specifically some of Kaczynski's own uh, critiques of the left. Um, you know, I, I thought about this question myself for a while, uh, uh, right, left, you know, I very much consider myself uh, on the left, but it is something that's difficult to define, right? Partly because these definitions tend to change so much, uh, partly because uh, the kind of like, I guess, the uh, most famous representatives uh, of each ideology are people that you might not necessarily even see much of yourself in, you know, like I don't see, you know, my own kind of values in someone like a Stalin, obviously, even though I see uh, long term some sort of, you know, collectivist uh, 
uh, maybe not purely egalitarian, but some definitely much more egalitarian than what it is today, right? Let's just don't even put a number on it, but just much more than than what's uh, currently uh, now. Um, uh, there's also the fact that, uh, like, just the way that this language gets used changes so much over time. Like, I mean, uh, Theodore Roosevelt was considered a, uh, like a classical conservative in his day. Right. Mm -hmm. And today, you know, with some of the proposals that he made, he would be considered in, ev in everyday politics today, like a radical environmentalist. Right. And, uh, people that call themselves on the right, they, com they, they completely reject this idea of uh well they're sort of coming around to it i think maybe with some of uh elon musk's for example takeover of twitter if elon musk manages to get a bunch of like you know votes for republicans it's very possible that you might see conservatives who are suddenly like you know what climate change israel israel but the only way that we could deal with it properly <laughs> is if we all invest in elon musk's ventures right then he will funnel votes to us right so i can imagine that kind of pathological thing transpiring but it isn't it kind of amazing that you know just if you just think about purely like, to see how far uh, we've come from what is rational uh when you think about the psychological divide if you're conservative you know physiologically and you believe in uh a thing called finite resources. You don't want to waste finite resources. You don't want to uh, uh, behave in a way that's anything other than circumspect with the only planet that you have to live on. And yet this is not a concern at all. You know, like, are these people really conservatives? Are they right-wing radicals? And if they are right-wing radicals, what is the difference between that and something like, like conservatism? Um, so um, anyway, I'm not sure if you want to respond to that or get into Kaczynski's critique, but I already said a lot there. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that like, there's this there's this really open question when when people when people are insisting on a given definition of left right and, and in particular if they're doing so to tell me because I am one of those people and there's this convention that usually if somebody says they're not on the left or the right it means that they're actually on the right right a lot of leftists claim this I am one of those people who who says like I'm seriously like I don't really consider myself on the left or the right. And the reason for that is, you know, if we use some definitions, if the definition is political equality, then I'm, I'm like an ardent leftist, right? You know, like I'm as egalitarian as it comes. But, um, you know, like the question that I always ask is if like people are insisting on a given definition, I'm like, I don't know. We could either say that that's the one true definition, or we could say that the very fact that there's so many competing definitions and such confusion about what this means and that it's a persistent source of division between people that seems to distract us from fighting more powerful individuals is the like fundamental character of the left right like that is the actual salient thing that we should be noting about the left right divide and like you say it's you know like i think like what it fundamentally i don't know if i want to say is but what it reflects is a you know are some underlying psychological differences and um i think that we can, if we look at, so like, let's imagine in a, in a hypothetical ancestral society, um, wherein there is the same range of traits that we see in today's populations that map to the right-left divide, but it's before the right-left divide has been articulated, or, you know, before it exists, there isn't sufficient social complexity. And, you know, so like one of, one of the, the trait that is the most predictive of, uh, of left-right political perceptions that's in like the kind of like mainstream sort of like psychometric trait landscape from the five-factor model is openness to new experience, right? So it, we can see how having like a wide range of uh, dispositions in terms of like behavioral flexibility and novelty and openness that's normally distributed could be really useful in an ancestral population, right? Like mm -hmm. if we if we discover a potential new food source, like, oh, look at these berries. If everybody eats the berries, we might all die. And if nobody eats the berries, we may lose like knowledge of a valuable food resource, right? It's actually better if some people eat the berries and some people don't. And um, I, I just like, I, I know that, I know that it's like, it's, I'm not a centrist. And I know that there's like a lot of people who have like a fairly similar politics to mine who find statements like this, like really like it raises their hackles or whatever. But like, unless we plan on exterminating every right winger, I think there really has to be some kind of meaningful framework for figuring out how these psychological tendencies they possess can actually be 
engaged in a social framework that it, like makes them useful. And I, and I don't think that that's, you know, that's not me saying like that I want right wing politics to to like prevail. But again, you know, like these are psychological tendencies and the right left divide is just like a manifestation of them that I think is pretty pathological. And I, I really think that um, that 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 is like we just like have to seriously acknowledge like one of one of the values of being willing to like actually engage with the biology of human behavior is like it forces us to recognize that these like perceptual differences are real and that if we're just like articulating left values as they exist in the society to people we're essentially talking to like projections of ourselves that we're like mm -hmm. you know versions of ourselves that we're projecting onto other people we have to like figure out a way to create a society <laughs> where like the psycho the psychological range that exists within our population can like somehow be like mobilized in, in a useful way and so like i but yeah like for whatever reason like environmentalism got coded left in the last like few decades it didn't used to be there was really a time like in the 70s where it wasn't clear richard nixon he he did more for the environment than literally any democrat says you know and the stuff that he said when he signed those laws in, into existence that you could never pass today is stuff that you couldn't get like the most green new deal democrat to say mm. now you know like um so yeah like I, it's not it, like it was never like clear that environmentalism was like even a left right to me that feels like not a core that's like one of those incidental like gun control or like federal versus local control it's like one of those things that truly hitchhiked along for the ride that doesn't really have an intrinsic left right dimension to it ultimately um and, and yeah like i i don't know i think that there's a a strong argument to be made for um like for whatever reason the right didn't uh didn't like a crew around environmentalism so you never had to like beat them away from the movement but leftism really did and i actually share kaczynski's perception that that i mean that really is a lot of why there is no radical environmental movement anymore like it did get kind of subsumed by leftism and so even though his like i find his analysis of leftists pretty crude i don't like it like it like very much has like the wingnut uncle like ranting about leftists vibe to it you know <laughs> just like if nothing else i don't find it very sophisticated <laughs> but um there, you know like i actually kind of share his perception that like if you wanted to have a movement of like ecological integration and like just kind of meaningfully moving society forward um into a form that could both like survive, but also like from my perspective, like create greater equality, that one very specific meaning of leftism, I, I think that you actually have to find a way to not let your movement be devoured mm. by left values. Yeah. Um, so speaking to like, so in, in your podcast, you mentioned some of these elements, right? That might be uh, coded into right and left. Um, for example, like responses to hierarchy, uh responses to change or like you know openness um and also th there's a third element sexuality so like i, I think it, it speaks to uh, the complexity of the human mind that and our ability to like bring you know to like build just total you know uh cathedrals like on on open air right um just by <laughs> strict argumentation that we could have for instance uh, uh you know let's say human beings uh, uh 50 000 years ago that maybe let's say about half of them are hard coded to be more conservative in every way, whether it's like sexually or whatever, simply because they need to uh, be able to survive better. Um, and uh, in the modern day, though, you could have like entire movements of people that are just like really hardcore moralizing in any kind of direction, for example, about, you know, individual sexual acts. Now, uh, in terms of like bringing people more under this kind of like wider umbrella, uh, but when I, for instance, think about like sexual questions, I always go back to what my friend uh, Keith Jackowicz, the one that introduced me to your podcast, said a few years ago. I remember he came to visit me. Uh, uh, he lives in New York City now, but back then he was visiting me and we were sitting on the train and he said something like, you know, when you see all these uh, uh, people that have like you know, fetishes like uh, they they like to shit in diapers and have their partners change them. Uh, you don't want to moralize about it and say like, oh, that's so bad and wrong and evil of you. But, you know, if you're like an intelligent human being, doesn't 
something at some point click in your head like what the fuck am I doing? I'm shitting myself and having someone change it to me and it's giving me pleasure. You know, there's just like something like just so off the wall and ridiculous and absurd about it. You know, it seems like it's a total waste of time. It seems like it's just so totally self-indulgent past the point of any kind of reasonable self-indulgence. Um, and I, I think like framing things not in this kind of like moralizing tone, but specifically a lot of these sexual questions, right? In kind of like almost, you know, cold, detached intellectual terms, that's probably a healthier way to view things. Uh, and it's much healthier than the right in America creating entire like, you know, groomer discourse and all this bullshit. And also like, honestly, like, you know, you know, I, 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 I don't, you know, I don't really care that much about trans stuff simply because like, first of all, like I'm resentful of the fact that we have like roughly equal numbers of trans people and native uh, Americans. Um, and yet like we, we only hear about the issues of trans people and mm -hmm. nothing at all, at all, ever, 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 ever about native American issues, despite the fact that, you know, they used to own all this land. And so now like the, the new thing in the right is uh, you have, you know, armed uh, groups showing up in like drag shows with uh, kids in the audience. And, um, you know, I don't want to like moralize about whether or not it's like uh, permissible for kids to see this. My uh, gut reaction immediately to that is not even about whether it's right or wrong. It's why the fuck is like a little kid at a drag show and not playing, not playing a video game, not like reading a book somewhere and not hanging out with friends. They're being taken by their parents to a drag show. That's kind of like the new version of a kid being dragged to Bible camp or some other, you know, some other variation of this. It, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to me like it's naturally what kids gravitate towards, you know? Um, and it's it's a bit, you know, there's there's that kind of left left wing authoritarianism part of it, like with like dragging kids maybe somewhere where they don't want to go for the sake of your values. But, you know, you also have the right wing authoritarianism where you have to physically put a stop to this. Right. Um, and, and just all of this just comes off as totally pathological. Yeah, well, I mean, in, and that's like it's interesting Kaczynski, uh, he gets out a few things again in his kind of like really informal, like. I'm just your like crazy ass fucking uncle who lives in, you know, Montana kind of like way that, you know, I have like more formal and academic language to use or whatever to talk about. But um, yeah, I mean, I think he he gets into that with his like, I think that what you're talking about in a way with like, you know, like the sort of like just sort of like endless exhausting exploration of various like pleasures and indulgences mm -hmm. you know, that like exists in whatever realm like sexuality or all these other places like he talks about it in the way that he does and to me it's very uh like the the kind of like academic framework to talk about it or whatever is like the post-materialist shift right this idea that once once the other needs in the hierarchy in like maslow's hierarchy of needs are met we you know we orient towards like self-actualization needs and like you know self-expression or whatever um and that can look really good if uh if there's like a certain level of like discipline or rigor or sort of like self like a willingness to challenge yourself going on there but then if it if that isn't present and consumer society kind of militates against it you know it's like very much about doing whatever literally just kind of feels good in the very immediate moment then yeah like our behavior ends up looking like if you take if you take a one of the reasons that zoos are complicated to run is because if you take an animal out of its environment and give it all of its like you know baseline physiological needs for free like you feed it and whatever else uh, a lot of animals just start masturbating like all day you know mm -hmm. <laughs> they literally just don't ever stop masturbating and uh sure like makes sense you know like what what the fuck else are you gonna do in a cage but um but like i really do think a lot of human society kind of looks like that you know and mm -hmm. it's like there there really is some i do think there's something there when he talks about there being like um an unhappiness associated with uh with like just you know the the relative ease um and then so like with which we meet our needs in the society and how that just like ends up looking like this like hyper elaborate sort of like grotesquely overdeveloped like just like capacity for like novelty seeking and sensation seeking of like any variety um and so then there's also this uh 
uh, neuroscientist Peter Sterling who goes into that a bunch and I think the the terminology he uses is like reward prediction error but he's basically like the dopamine system needs to um to like be sort of surprised by the rewards that it gets or else it just like the threshold just gets set higher and higher mm -hmm. and you know so like ultimately it's not like people in industrial civilizations are like hyper consumer societies are necessarily actually experiencing more pleasure because you know like with drugs or anything else you just got to like shoot more and more to get to that same place um and yeah so that's like i i do i think a lot of culture war issues and a lot of like a lot of stuff that's coded very uh left right it's like i don't really agree with either perspective but i think if you put that that theme into it you know that like idea of like um consumer society just kind of glitching us out and forcing us into like ex like various experiential extremes um that's like a good way to actually look at a lot of those culture war issues like that you know because mm -hmm. even like even if you just take like kind of like unreasonable radical viewpoints in and of themselves like that's another form of that right like reasoning processes themselves produce like a reward you know like a neurological reward and if you're in a certain like hyper technological milieu where like groups are like defining themselves according to certain frames or values and there's like a kind of reward in like reinforcing the like unique logic of the group at the expense like in differentiating it from other ways of seeing the world it becomes gratifying to like you know just like take perspectives to their most like extreme disconnected ridiculous forms you know mm -hmm. um so so Kaczynski has this uh he 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 sort of makes uh, the admission i guess that uh this is not a very kind of like neat set of distinctions right he he does emphasize in a few points that the right left divide isn't that neat and specifically when we try to categorize who fits uh, in the left spectrum um we're going to hit upon some obstacles but to him this was i guess in the 90s uh the the thing that um fits the most under the left right so pc political correctness animal rights feminism gay rights anti-racism um i i think there's definitely something to it especially when you think about uh the kinds of ideas that do become popular in i don't know like uh, mainstream academic circles or twitter circles right there's the whole kind of you know um uh, uh abraham uh kendi uh, uh you know how to be an anti-racist right that's kind of a classical thing right i wouldn't actually put that into the category of of leftism at leftism, all right. um simply because uh you know there there isn't actually uh in, you know sufficiently enough there to actually make any sort of differences it seems to be more kind of like you know uh, virtue signaling and discourse it's not actually about you know what it, like like one thing that struck me about the whole kind of a, a stop Asian hate thing from uh, 2021 uh, uh, wasn't the fact that um, it was, you know, it was, first of all, people were denying that uh, it was really black Americans that were mostly involved in uh, this violence against Asian people. And the reason why they were denying, well, there's a couple things. First of all, right, uh, uh, they want to pretend that black Americans are a, uh, on the one hand, a protected group. But then on the other hand, they don't want to actually do anything to take the sort of, you know, risks that are necessary to actually, you know, push them from protected uh, status to like, you know, equal to everyone else. Right. Um, so you, you, you would see like all these like Asian academics, right. That would write all these, you know, articles in, in early 2021 and, um, not one of them, you could tell, like, they probably don't live around black people. They probably don't necessarily want to see their taxes uh, go up to actually redistribute wealth and and actually you know put it into the hands of people um, that would um, you know uh, become more equal in that way. And of course, right, they don't want to shed light on the fact that you know the the ma the vast majority of Black Americans that get involved in this kind of violence would be you know they're people that are homeless right there are people that are in it out of like the carceral system and these are real actual social issues it's not just you know a purely racial thing right um and th there's a kind of uh racial reductionism among elites now that is 
uh, it's 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 one way for them to get published and for them to virtue signal, and it's also simultaneously a way for them to avoid the underlying structural reasons for things being the way that they are. Like they say structural racism, but they don't actually mean structural racism in the way that I would understand the phrase structural racism. So um, with some of these categories, it seems like he is uh, discussing, uh, you know, I was a child in the 90s, so I wouldn't know. But uh, from uh, my readings now and people that I speak to that were, you know, adults back then, uh, you know, political correctness maybe had it had its heyday there. So I would associate all this stuff with a specific strain of liberalism that is not even necessarily on the left. And it's a kind of liberalism that often taps, you know, middle class, upper middle class, and also upper class sensibilities. You know, um, so uh, like, like, what are your response to some of those categories that he lists? Yeah, I mean, I totally. I think that um, that again is actually like I would use the the academic frame of the post materialist shift to talk about uh, these like changing meanings of leftism, right? You know, whereas like there was there was a time when we might have had fuzzy definitions. I think there was never a time where there wasn't like these kind of like at least dual meanings where on the one hand it's like about equality and on the other hand it's about like a willingness to accept like novelty and like experimentation with different social forms um and like those aren't intrinsically related you know it's not like all of human history has been hyper hierarchical so those aren't intrinsically logically related elements but um you know we see in like hyper affluent post world war ii societies that leftism decreasingly means anything about like economic equality or like any kind of like really like material mm -hmm. reality at all in a lot of cases you know like as you as you uh see more and more people on the left coming out of academia you see more and more an emphasis on the kinds of like techniques on like an analysis that relates to the techniques that academics can use right you know so it's like way more about language and discourse and like uh like contesting on a symbolic plane right right as opposed to like a material one um and uh and then but you know like ronald Englehart in the silent revolution where that term the post-materialist shift gets coined you know he talks about how like part of that like uh that sort of like diminishment of material need as being like a real like predictor of you know like a, a primary psychological reality for people is that their politics like the psychological tendencies that produce like a difference in perception of equality versus hierarchy are going to start mapping out to like these more niche specialized realms of you know contestation and so like yeah i mean that's like that's if for no other reason to me the fact that for many people left right means a combination of like uh professional middle class an academically inflected sort of like uh privilege discourse combined with like stalinism you know like mm -hmm. that's enough for me to be like i don't know if this terminology is totally worth fighting for like you know like that's a lot of fucking baggage to get over and those are just like emphatically not my politics um but yeah like um i i think that um i i think that he's right that that's like kind of what left increasingly means and um that you know that again like that, i think that just really argues those tendencies um because it's so because those politics the like um the post-materialist leftist politics are so wrapped up in discourse and symbolism it becomes it like that makes it very hard to work with people who practice those politics because so much of their methodology so much of like what they are approaching reality from the perspective of is about like uh contestation on the symbolic plane so it's like really hard to like come up with concrete strategies because people are just literally going to want to like d dissect language and like talk 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 endlessly you know and um I, I I think that he's really right that you know it's like I think he's really right that the the kind of revolution he's talking about is not leftist and that if it becomes subsumed by leftism, it's not going to like work or happen.
What, what do you think about his more uh, specific critiques of the kind of like psychological strain uh, that emerges in what he terms, let's just say what he terms leftism. Um, so he, he describes uh, on the one hand, a feeling of personal inferiority and uh, this like ironic hatred for marginalized groups. And I mean, there could be different reasons for that. Um, and also this kind of like over socialization and hypersensitivity to uh, words, uh, politically correct traits. I um, mean, also, he doesn't touch on this too much, but I guess we could throw it in there. Uh, we sort of alluded to this when we described, uh, for instance, our responses to uh, human nature, this kind of a denial of objectivity, right? Um, either in yeah. this kind of like crass fashion or in the more kind of implied fashion. I mean, being in the arts, right, I, I know that this is like the, the number one sort of thought now, right, where... You're not supposed to judge the arts. You're not supposed to establish any kind of hierarchies. You can't say one work of art is a greater or less than another work of art. So those are his like three elements, right? Uh, what do you think about the first? So this feeling of personal inferiority and this like ironic hatred for marginalized groups. Because uh, uh, in upper class liberal circles, I definitely see this like maybe it's not maybe hatred is not necessarily the best word for this but there's definitely a distrust of a discomfort with right um uh this like you know people that would never ever want to live you know like in a non-white neighborhood right uh that's definitely at play and you know i really do wonder like to what extent can you even have any kind of egalitarian politics where you systematically kind of you know, uh, moat yourself away from, you know, essentially people that don't live like you, that don't look like you, right? Theoretically, you could say uh, whatever you want, but the way it's going to come out is there's always going to be some sort of pathology. I'm reminded of how my wife told me about one of her uh, friends uh, who who's black and she had a, a white boyfriend. And when she, when, when uh, uh, he visited her in her neighborhood, he was afraid to go like jogging in the neighborhood because it was a black neighborhood because he was about to get mugged. And, you know, like, obviously you could say like that, you know, that's obviously a form of racism. But I think the, the, the most shocking thing of all is, you know, this guy who was like six foot four or something, like over 200 pounds, clearly athletic, going on a jog. Like, if you think that you specifically are the target in this neighborhood for being mugged, you must not understand how human violence works what you know people who want to mug others are thinking but they're looking for victims right they're not looking for you know a white man who's going to be noticed if he goes missing who's you know clearly large and powerful and is on a jog and probably doesn't have any money on him right um and it's, it's like a total disconnect from everyday reality and i think kaczynski does you know he doesn't go explicit about this but i think he could by implication sort of maybe draw some of this out of his argument yeah, I mean, right. So, so those are like, so the three components, just so I'm totally clear, it's like, because I don't have that part of the text right in front of me, but it's like the, the like feeling of like inferiority, um, the like uh, hatred for marginalized groups and the like rejection of objectivity. Are those, the, those are the three? Uh well, the, the the objectivity thing we can maybe touch on, but the, the second point, the over-socialization, right? Oh, um, yeah, yeah. I guess like, I, I guess the example of this white guy afraid to jog, over-socialized, meaning he consumed too much v media to the uh, point that it totally interfered with his understanding of baseline, like human reality. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so like, I, I think that the, I, the fucking, the way that, um, the way that I like kind of read his thing about like the feelings of inferiority or whatever, is that I do see in the psychology that again like maps to the politics of leftism um in in the like hypermodern context it seems like one of the like sort of ways that um this the reasoning has like taken on this very like extreme pathological quality is that you know uh leftists tend to focus more on the way that uh external like you know structural conditions constrain people's potentials and like you know shape people's individual outcomes and the right because they're justifying hierarchy tends to claim more that you know like individual outcomes emerge from like our innate tendencies or whatever um i think that using either of these in isolation is like totally ridiculous and insane and pathological you know like like obviously individual outcomes 
are the result of those two factors combined um, in that there, there does end up being this thing in leftist psychology where it's like that focus on structural conditions and that de-emphasis of individual innate attributes kind of translates into this like resentment of any really just like any dialogue about like furthering yourself or bettering yourself or like exhibiting any strength or acknowledging that life takes effort and that people exert differential effort mm -hmm. and that like you know and so and that's like i think that that is like one of the psychological mechanisms whereby uh the right can like win a lot of framing and like values arguments is like if you've ever been like running up a mountain and halfway up the mountain you're like i hate weakness like you know like i'm going to fucking get up this mountain you know like if you've ever been like in one of those situations where it's like down to the wire and you had to like step up and if you didn't step up you wouldn't be here to talk about it today you know it's like you know this this thing that's important that's essential for us to nurture in ourselves which is like life takes effort you know like you have to be strong to you do you have to be strong to survive and that doesn't justify like a, a social system that's like cruel and despotic but it's you know like it also like cre trying to create a s social system that isn't cruel and despotic doesn't justify being fucking weak you know mm -hmm. and uh and i think so i think that's like to me that's what i got out of that that i do agree with is like there's that leftist psychology that's like we should focus so much on equality that we should like just kind of like reject effort and, and like strength you know I, I'm, I'm like that's that's like not you know that's not my trip and and i have seen that totally like thwart and complicate political projects before so i'm i'm like basically kind of on board although once again he says it in the wingnut uncle way or whatever right you know mm -hmm. but like yeah um, um can you touch on what you said or what you said earlier about um uh th this idea that uh because he also talks about this is this idea that leftist values can very much interfere with some kind of you know positive project that you might have such as for instance uh you know tackling climate change and making the world uh livable uh for for centuries more um uh, what what did you mean by that exactly and d does it tie into uh kaczynski's critique here well yeah because um because i've just seen that um okay like in the most the most fundamental sense like challenging systems of power requires like being willing to i don't know risk some like adversity you know and um people are differentially willing to do that but i've really seen like a lot of a lot of like uh the way that leftist morality gets uh like i kind of exploited in political processes and like discourses about strategy is like to kind of hide the fact that some people aren't feeling the courage to like i think we need a cultural framework that promotes people doing brave things to intervene in the systems of power that are destroying us and uh i've seen leftist morality do essentially the opposite where it like makes people feel like guilty for being willing to take risk and to like engage in confrontation because they're not like you know because not everybody is and then that somehow is like supposedly like centering you or whatever you know right like um and then likewise i've just i've seen a lot of uh a lot of like unwillingness a lot of fear about engaging in those kind of confrontations get like kind of dressed up in some sort of privilege discourse that makes it seem like noble to like not fight you know um and so yeah again it's it's just that thing like I believe in a culture of strength. Like I believe in trying to create a just social system, but I don't think that's incompatible with like, I, I think that that's not going to happen. And this is one of those ways like leftism. I was just talking with another like YouTube uh, creator about this the other day about how like, if you look at leftist propaganda from like a, a century ago, it's like, it's like, it looks like fucking Thor, you know, it's like literally like a muscle bound dude with a hammer, like bashing the serpent of fascism, you know, it's like, mm -hmm indra the fucking thunder deity incarnate in like the cnt fai propaganda or whatever and like that i'm i'm about that but but all, like specifically on some of those like leftist uh values getting in the way of 
uh, any of these like climate projects. One thing that I'm thinking about now is, uh, and this is specifically T uh, Kaczynski's argument, where he says that, you know, if you build a, a new kind of world that's based, you know, kind of like on, on scarcity once more, um, leftists, they want to increase GDP. They want to make sure that people have a decent standard of living. Right now, one of the big issues in the world is we have billions of people in poverty. Uh, I can't imagine if we, you know, if there's some sort of vanguard that captures uh, power worldwide and we we transition into some sort of degrowth economy, those people aren't necessarily going to be lifted up. And if they would get lifted up, it probably would be slower. And many people that would be natural allies to us they might stand in the way um like like how do you deal with that or maybe how might how might you deal also with introducing uh questions of like a degrowth economy to people um while also trying to keep you know lefties on your side well yeah i mean right there there is a huge like i mean first of all i just i do want to acknowledge like yeah in that in those specific realms there's a huge barrier and, you know, I, like, I think that you can see that in uh, the fucking population conversations where I'm just like, I, you know, like to me, it, 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 it's crazy that it can't be that there's like not a capacity to talk about how there might be an optimal pop human population that is like significantly lower than the one that we currently have, um, uh, which to me feels like that, like you know, any, like literally any acknowledgement of just like limits of there being like, like non-negotiable physical parameters that we as a species have to fucking acknowledge. Right. Um, you know, and it's like, um, like that conflicts with a certain ver type of leftist morality. And it, like, I, I often quip that, um, much as I feel like right wing and to some extent, just like kind of normal American perceptions of police are high, heavily informed by cop movies. I, I literally do feel like a lot of leftist perceptions of technology and ecological limits are informed by science fiction. Like no joke. Mm -hmm. I, I like really think that's where a lot of it is coming from. And um, so, you know, like, to, it, it, well, and like, and this kind of touches on that, like, do leftists secretly hate or do like certain people with leftist psychology uh, kind of like secretly hate marginalized groups is like, when you have a conversation like this, whether it's about degrowth or population or whatever, um, and people are like, you can't talk about this because this inevitably logically progresses into a racist discussion about genocide. And I'm like, I, I, it does, you know, like that's like, maybe you're saying more about yourself than you are about the intrinsic logical properties of this discussion, right? Because to me, I'm like, whoa, that's stark. That's like really not, you know, like to me, it's like, if you wanted to have a human social program that's non-coercive, that's based around like a broad social consensus, um about there being like an, an optimal human population it's literally like what you would want to do is talk about it and collectively like decide that there's some like you know that there's a, a number out there that's like ideal to strive for and that would mm -hmm. like that would in fact be the like mode of contestation for for like a, a population outcome um but you know so like degrowth in general uh, um and especially like with regard to people um in uh you know, in the global South or who have, who are otherwise in like subordinate positions in the global economy. I mean, I think that the way that like the Steven Pinkers of the world make it sound like they have been on these trajectories towards greater like abundance, um, at least below certain thresholds. Like I wouldn't deny that, uh, say like people in China are actually, you know, capturing more like material abundance, like for better or for worse. But in a lot of the like, like poorer nations, it's basically like, it requires like these absurd metrics where like, you're literally using the dollar amounts that are in their economies as like a proxy for their well being. And obviously, like, at a certain point before they're incorporated into a global system, the dollar values associated with their lives were zero. But that doesn't mean that they were living lives of fucking scarcity, right? You know, mm -hmm. And um, so I think that there's like a real conversation to be had here about like, just like returning, um, returning like um, autonomy to people's like uh, direct interactions with the environments they inhabit and like deriving subsistence from that. And so that's a way that 
that's a way that my politics is not it's not primitivist or anything it's not even explicitly anti-tech but i feel like it's really different from left right politics and is more like oriented towards ecological realities and degrowth is that i believe that people become fundamentally unfree when they no longer possess a direct means of subsistence from their environment right when it's no longer an option to just mind your own business and like plant some seeds and hunt and fish and what however else you want to like make a living but that's like a direct you know like like an unmediated like you don't have to work for anybody and you don't necessarily have to engage in any like collaboration or like networks of cooperation and that doesn't exclude that right like you can you can have a society like that where there's like trade networks and like any level of social complexity and exchange that you want to engage in but i think that like if it's not an option for you to just kind of make your own damn living like you know directly from the earth you have become unfree and so to me that's just like a different emphasis like i want to return people to like i want to i want to give people that at least as an option and like return economies to a more local uh you know like a greater degree of localization not that i i would like necessarily want to see like trade altogether like uh negated but um that's a different way you can't measure that wealth in terms of gdp or any of the like metrics that's not about redistributing like like redistributing money or anything like that right that's just like about a different like a totally different like mode of like human ecology and uh so that like that is not something that a lot of leftists are necessarily sold on right now but i do think that's something that can be talked about in terms of greater freedom and greater equality so it at least has like you know and, and and like just to be clear like i want to make sacrifices to make that happen like i'm willing to live in a world where there's not like bananas in grocery stores 365 days a year right you know to like if i got to have access to like some land to produce food you know it's a, it's going to be a set of trade-offs but I, I would prefer to live in a world like that you know where like i had that freedom at the again this is like how you frame freedom where i had that freedom to directly pursue a subsistence routine at the expense of the freedom to go buy like fucking tomatoes from Chile at three in the morning. Yeah, uh, but even uh, the psychology of some of that scarcity, uh, I think uh, uh, it's a little bit underrated in some of the positives. Like I remember uh, uh, when I was born, I was born in uh, uh, Belarus, right? Um, oh, really? Like before yeah, before it was, uh, uh, before the USSR broke up. Right. And I remember, um, one of my like some of my happiest moments would be one of the very very rare opportunities that i could walk to the market and get a banana to me it was like yeah. just this unbelievable fruit i was like oh my god this tastes so wonderful and i would eat it so slowly and so lovingly and uh you know uh, it's just amazing to me that there could be like bananas lying around and th theoretically i don't necessarily want to have one at that moment right it reminds me of uh my great grandmother she would tell me that uh during uh, world war ii um uh, because she was uh so hungry they had like about like a hundred grams of wheat flour they were given as rations every day they would make a porridge out of it she said, uh, I, I can't imagine that I could have bread on the table and that I don't want to devour it right away. Um, uh, even like even little things like when I was uh, when I, I used to be morbidly obese and then I started losing weight, I started really craving the idea that any time that I would step on the scale, I saw it would go down by a, like a pound or even sometimes two pounds because I was on a really crazy like restrict restrictive diet. And I really grew to love that hunger, right? And I think there's something very healthy about those elements of human psychology that are kind of geared towards scarcity enjoying scarcity and un uh, understanding how to like uh yeah i mean even like you know uh, the, the kind of wider examples of technology right i mean we clearly had lives before smartphones we didn't have to check what was going on, on twitter none of that is essential still and yet you know a, a lot of this does seem like it's just kind of like this uh cultivated fantasy right that certain things are necessary that you do need bananas 24 7 right um and you know uh, it seems to me there is probably ways to uh disrupt that 
fantasy without necessarily uh, throwing people into actual poverty or, or keeping the people in poverty still in poverty. I haven't read you know many of the specifics of what degrowth would look like, but um, uh, maybe it's something to think about. Or maybe you could also answer like 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 what exactly like I guess in relation to Tech Kaczynski or maybe some things you might do differently. What exactly do you see happening in terms of uh, transitioning to a different economy? Like, are we just waiting for some sort of a climate collapse? It does seem to me like we're just going to wait more or less to the last minute. I don't think we're going to go extinct or anything, but we're probably going to fuck things up enough where, you know, when it's time to pull back from the brink, we're probably going to have a billion or two billion plus climate yeah. refugees, right? We're probably going to have hundreds of millions of deaths altogether, maybe at least. Um, and I, I think it's probably at that point that people will start uh, uh, in this kind of like thinking about a true transitional state. Like how do you imagine that process going about? And do you agree that it's probably going to take some some level of collapse, maybe not in the sci-fi way, but some level of collapse before people start really doing something about it? Yeah, I mean... Well, so first of all, just to like, just to like acknowledge what you said, like, yeah, I mean, I grew up with a ton of scarcity too, you know, and I, I definitely like am aware that of like the profundity of the, that motivation and that like sense of like wanting to hustle up whatever, like little, um, but you know, but I also like, it's just, I really do think it's about those dopamine thresholds, right. You know, cause I can also remember, uh, like times where the power would go out and all of a sudden like life shifted in this radical way. And we definitely had less, uh, you know, less of the like conveniences than we were used to. Uh, but those were actually my favorite days. Those were those were the best days of my like whole childhood, you know, um, it was like winter storm days with no power in Vermont. And um, so, you know, like and that's like the first time I really started thinking about that, where I'm like, you're always going to navigate a complex set of trade offs with that stuff. You're going to like feel the trade offs, but that ultimately there really is something to be said for like less of an easily accessed hyperpotent reward stimuli than this society has to offer ultimately, you know? Um, but yeah, um, I, I mean, I think that probably I, I might even be like a little less optimistic than you because I just, I see, I really think that some of the like major feedbacks have been probably pretty decisively triggered. Um, in the climate system, you know, like I, I really think we are going to get like pretty significant releases of permafrost from the Arctic and stuff like that. Um, and the way that the, the variable that I see um, causing like a really undeniable, uh, like temporally sustained and truly global crisis, like the way I think that's going to happen first is probably with the food system. Um, we're already kind of seeing, you know, like if you limits to growth, that other thing we talked about reading, like mm -hmm. the resource curves in that, um, the first one to go, because we really are on the limits to growth trajectory. The first curve to crash is the food curve, you know, and it's like we are right. You know, 2018 was the first year that there was like a deep a net decline in a global agricultural output since like the fucking green revolution man you know and like decades and decades and uh well what exactly what, is the reason for that uh, with the weather you know okay. just because like in a lot of it is like this is a way in which uh how we talk about climate outcomes i think is wrong when we talk about the means of different values like you know temperature precipitation whatever i really think we should be talking about a measure of their variability their standard deviation or whatever you know um because it's not like it's not like if you look at the mean temperatures that prevailed in any given part of the world where there were massive crop failures, it's not like those are like outside of the range of like, you know, viable conditions for producing crops. But when you have behavior like it, it like doesn't rain all spring and then there's a deluge in summer or it like, you know, there's like a, temperatures are unseasonably warm so plants don't harden and then there's a sudden precipitous drop and like in the cold snap they die in the frost or whatever you know like when you just have like a like more erratic weather it's harder to grow crops and so that like that's kind of what did it and we're so we're seeing an acceleration of that trend where now like the the curve really is the limits to growth curve in terms of agricultural output where it's like 
it flattened a couple of years ago and now it's just kind of flat and if it, if it follows the limits to growth model it's just going to be a couple of years before it really starts to go down man and that is that is going to be the mid to late 2020s you know that is going to be when we start to like there's no guarantee we'll talk about it in these terms like we might just talk about how food is more expensive like we might talk about commodity mm -hmm. speculation and fucking grocery store prices and inflation and all this stuff but like the fundamental driver of that will be reduced agricultural output because of the weather and i think that's going to be that's going to be like uh you know and kaczynski talks about this he actually says like we're gonna this is all going to be decided in the next few decades and you know like when the system experiences a true crisis is when the opportunity for revolution is going to present itself and i fundamentally agree with that i fundamentally think that when that i think it'll be a food crisis and when it happens is going to be the first time that we can talk seriously about like what options exist for ecological revolution yeah uh, I, that's I, no I, guarantee <laughs> i i i think kaczynski's uh comments in terms of the time frame that he uh, presents in the 90s that that was pretty good right he did good, uh, he, he he did lay out right that this this would be starting around the time where we would start noticing this a lot more so he was at least uh very much correct on that i started noticing like um you know in the uh, i i was in new york city most of my life so uh i you know i'm used to seeing what the four seasons are like uh, and in the 2010s, right, like that's when really summer started going pretty haywire, right? I remember yeah, exactly. uh, there was there, there was one night or like a few nights rather in 2013 where uh, me and uh, uh, with my wife now, but my girlfriend at the time, like we thought we were going to die one of the nights because we, we didn't have the air conditioner installed and it was so hot that literally it was like, all right. We're going to we're going to die in this house right right it was it was that just uh putrid uh, of, of an environment um and I, I i'm imagining like so like at the end of the 2010s we started seeing more and more wildfires right this is going to be very much the norm i don't see anybody really doing anything in terms of like really putting any preparation in place right there may be some stuff kind of like going on like in the background with like all right we know there's gonna be more fires to deal with but i don't i don't really see you know public public investment is not really a thing anymore right when right. we look at something like the uh, uh inflation uh reduction act right it's a propaganda term for it but regardless um you know these are like what these are all tax incentives for private companies this is very different from the FDR style public investment that would be necessary to, um, you know, both protect the environment, but also, you know, just kind of changing the economy. So it's not based on the old uh, uh, kind of uh, old kind of models. Um, but uh, anyway, I I'm not sure if you, if you want to talk about, uh, uh, I guess, yeah. briefly uh, Kaczynski's other book or maybe uh, uh, close out some other thoughts before we transition to the patron show. Yeah, well, I mean, so uh, I think that this is an interesting because, um, yeah, I, I would say the climate of the Holocene ended in 2012. Right. And then it's like in 2013, you start globally, you start seeing really different weather. Um, and I, I don't really know exactly why that is. It's just like, you know, some threshold got crossed. But yeah, um, I think that this is one way because you're right. There is no preparation happening for this. And that's like one of the it's weird like the more you like inhabit really specific variables with this stuff like the more detail you get into the more it kind of hurts and so like one of the things that i used to do that fucked me up the most was just like go through climate uh you know mitigation but also adaptation plans of different governments and like different polities you know and there's just nothing there man it's just all literally fucking infographics like there there is just nothing that is happening to to prepare for any of this stuff and so that is a question like in terms of like what is the trajectory of a potential revolutionary effort as shit collapses um there, i think that there's this really interesting way in which we could like, transcend the left right divide uh, a little bit with uh there being this real need for us to just like we just need to like do some shit like we just need to like you know take some basic fucking measures like some like fucking sandbags and like tear up some golf courses and plant some staples just like some basic shit and they're um in like modern like hyper modern technological societies there is this like tendency for a fracture for like 
uh, people with more left psychology to be more involved in like symbolic production and like culture and science and stuff like that. And for right wingers to more be like dudes with trucks, you know, like dudes who like know how to like move big, heavy things around. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think a very underestimated aspect of right wing psychology and what motivates their culture and politics in uh, today's age is the sense of inauthenticity. Like we're ex like everybody's experiencing some version of it. And for all those country songs that are about how like they'll stop and fix somebody's tire on the side of the road and how all the neighbors say hi and all that shit like that's not what rural America is fucking like, man. It's like the same like alien landscape of alienation and like, you know, everybody glitching out on their weird corners of the internet and like shooting up Oxycontin as every fucking where else in America. And people feel this real need to like, they want something to participate in. Like they want some way to use their like, their like prowess and their strength and their fucking trucks and their winches and their chainsaws to like do something, you know? And to like be part of something that feels fucking authentic and uh and like helps them, you know, and like connects them to people. And so there is this real sense in which the climate adaptation that we need to do is this thing that really like in theory could unite kind of different functionally specialized like realms of society into some you know bigger project of collective survival. <laughs> Again, that's not the only thing that could happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, I don't know. So those are, um, those are kind of like my thoughts about about like the near term sort of like likely ecological trajectory and and what happens socially in response. And uh, as far as like Ted K goes, um, his other his other book, I think like the one uh, the one thing that it really gets into um, that's different or like that I thought was particularly interesting. Um, that definitely isn't in uh, the manifesto is this like he uses this language that's kind of better than any of the abstract like systems theory language I had seen before to talk about the dynamics of growth and collapse. And he just he like he uses this terminology of self-propagating systems and he like sets up these conditions under which any self-propagating system will grow until it collapses. Right. You know, it's about like tempor. It's about temporality. It's about like whether there's an incentive for short, short term growth, basically, you know. Um, so, it, you know, it's an interesting book, but it's also oh, and it's very Lenin heavy. That's not something I saw coming really? at all. Hmm. Yeah. But he's all like, it, you know, because he's just like it kind of it it shows the same obsession with like weeding out the elements of a potential social movement that are like kind of like soft or like you know obsessed with like various side quests or whatever and somehow he just like ends up using Lenin over and over again as like a paradigmatic model of like a hard motherfucker who stayed folk which is you know like I mean I just read like an 800 page history of the Russian Revolution and I have to say Lenin is one of those people where it makes you realize that sometimes actually individuals really do affect history in very profound ways mm -hmm. you know uh, that like there were a lot of different ways that phase of instability that they kind of like turned into the Bolshevik revolution more or less after the fact like could have gone a lot of different ways you know and uh, uh is, it, know. is it that uh that uh book on the Russian revolution that's been recently going around uh what, what's the name of it the one I read is called a people's tragedy yeah I I think I've, I've I'm hearing it referenced more and more over the last couple of years um I like it is something for me to check out but i mean as we transition into uh this uh, uh patron show maybe let's titillate the audience a little bit so you brought up lenin i i want to bring up leninism and my own kind of i guess uh, early experiences uh with that and just kind of like it's i think it's uh, illustrative of how uh lefties get funneled into all kinds of possible niches and corners right and possibly dead ends um we're we're about like a half generation apart so but we both i think grew up on the internet right i yeah. i was lucky enough to have a, a computer uh early growing up so i was pretty much on the internet uh on devices from the get-go um and uh, i think you and i both are probably very very heavy forum users um yeah. so uh, maybe something to discuss uh that um this idea of like living in a transitional uh state right it, it really does feel like we're kind of in the middle of a turning point in a way that um I, I guess it gets discussed a little bit but it's not 
uh, it, it often gets co-opted, right? Like by, okay, so for like liberals, it's like our transitional stages, we might have fascism in the form of Republicans. And for Republicans, it's, you know, we're in the transitional state where uh, the state is going to take all your children and chop off their dicks, right? Um, but there's no actual like uh, analysis there and a bunch of other stuff. I mean, I, I never really know uh, specifically what we're going to talk about, but it's often nice, long and good on these uh, bonus shows. So if you guys want to check that out, that's patreon.com slash automachination. You get not only this show after show, everything that we do on the channel, you would support our literary articles and film reviews and automachination.com all the stuff you would get by supporting our work here. So thank you, Arnold. Thank you for viewers. And we'll come back with something soon. And for patrons, please stick around for the bonus show.